Welcome to The Leader's Mindset, where we have illuminating conversations with people who are making an impact in their jobs, in their families, in their communities, and how they're becoming leaders and building the teams they need to make the kind of impact they want to make in the world. Today we have with us Jennifer Barber. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. You've been a digital marketing strategist, a creative director, yes. an agency owner, so <laughs> many other things. We're going to get into all of it also. You've been named one of the top 30 women bosses here in Las Vegas, breaking news today. Yes. So first, congratulations. Thank you. And I'd love to hear all about that when we get to it. So I'm just, I'm so, I've known you for a little while, and I'm so excited to sit down with you today and talk. So tell us about you. Tell us about your journey. Where did you go as back as far as you want? Where did you start out? And what was the path to sitting in this chair today? Right. Well, first of all, thank you. It's an honor to be here. You're doing some amazing things to uh, to just spread the message out there about leadership and, you know, overall just to collectively bring people together in unity. Um, how I started? Well, I, I grew up poor. Um, we all have these amazing stories of struggles. And I think uh, I want to preface my life on that because it's become such an intrinsic part of my ev evolved self that I, I have to honor what I was before. Uh, we were poor. I grew up in the Philippines, so um, raised by my grandmother, who was my mentor in life. Um, she was a strong woman. I admire her for, you know, she was the matriarch. She took care of everybody in the household, and she was a leader. Um, so I've, I've had a great first start to observe a strong women leadership in the family. <laughs> um, I had a big family in the Philippines, so our culture is, it's really, uh, we help each other out. There's a lot of love, right? Um, but my mother was out of the country, and, you know, I was being raised by my uncles, my aunts, my grandma. Um, flew uh, a plane to Canada by myself at 10 years old. <laughs> that was a scary experience of my life Dad. at 10 years old. I haven't seen my mom for a while, but she says, Canada has a great opportunity for you to, to come and live with me and build a life here, better opportunities from the Philippines. And I said, why not? So I hopped on this plane and uh, had a stopover at Hong Kong and they put me in a wheelchair and they wheeled me around and I thought that was fun because you're 10 years old and you're like, why not? So I got to Canada and that's where basically I had my, um, education, uh, British standard. Um, I had to learn. English was my second language. I understood English, but I didn't speak it. So there was a bit of a transition that needs to happen. But through the process, um, I went through it. My mother was an entrepreneur. She had a restaurant and she had a grocery store. <laughs> so can you imagine that? I walked into this woman who was very driven and a hard worker right? And I just watched. I mean, this is my mom. I haven't, I mean, my grandmother raised me. So there was some strong women in my family <laughs> at that point. And um, my experience was, um, you know, just witnessing that, that the opportunity to create a better life for yourself was really in my, uh, at that, the forefront of what I was seeing with my family. And that's that's how I've always felt. That was carried in my heart. But I wanna just go back a little bit because I will tie this all in. At five years old, I had a neighbor and she showed me a, a pen pal. You know when people still used to write love letters to each other and actually took the time to craft a letter? She says, I have this pen pal in the US. He's in the army, he's a US army and uh, I really like him. And she showed me a postcard, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was a postcard of San Diego. And I said, I looked at it at five years old and I said, I wanna be able to go there someday. I don't know what it was, but at that very moment, I really vividly recollected that I looked at that postcard and I said, I'm gonna marry an American guy and I'm gonna live in San Diego five years old. So I'll come back. So I was in Canada. I studied in Canada. I followed um, the path that most Asian parents would want for their children. And we all know that is mm -hmm. I had three options to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer. Um, I did none of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that. Um, but I did well in school. I was uh, an overachiever, right? And 
not necessarily because I was just born and raised to be an overachiever. I, at a young age, I saw poverty. I saw hardship. I saw struggles. I saw a murder of my grandfather. Um, it was tough. It was, it was tough. And I said, um, I'm not going to waste this life. At, at a young age, I already knew I was going to be someone someday. And I couldn't quite configure how it's all going to play out, but I just made I, almost like a declaration to the universe at that point that I'm going to make something happen, right? So fast forward, studied in Canada, uh, excelled uh, in school. I didn't really struggle much in school. I had student of the year in my um, high school and then moved to uh, you know, university and things like that. Um, then, then because I just went straight where I just studied and I worked hard, there was a gap in there of enjoying life and being a, uh, you know, living life <laughs> as we speak. So um, the journey took me to, uh, after university, like after college, I basically went from that to, um, you know, to moving towards um, uh, finding an opportunity. And I was offered an opportunity to work for a private investment firm in Vancouver, Canada. At that time, I was staying at Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, you know, uh, if you if you know Canada, you know it's cold, right? <laughs> and I said, okay, why not? Vancouver is warmer than Edmonton, which is <laughs> flat prairie land and minus forty degrees Celsius, where everything shut down and nothing works. So I went. My my journey took me after you know uh, school to work for an investment firm. Now that wasn't in the plan. I wasn't supposed to go into any kind of investment firm or business or any marketing of any sort, but I went with the flow because I knew that I couldn't, I, I was at the point in my life where I think I'm doing this to, to make my family happy, right? I don't know if I can do this for a living, mm -hmm. you know, what they want me to do. And those are very noble, admirable uh, jobs. But something inside me, and I listened to that voice, that inner voice, Jen, it's crippling for your soul. This is not who you are. You're very creative. You're right, you got your right brain and your left brain. You're logical, but you're also very intuitive and emotional and, and spiritual. And how, how do I come together? Where do I fit in the puzzle? Like at that point in time, you know, I didn't know about mentorship, coaching, any of that. I wasn't subjected to that growing up. I was subjected to three profession, to be a, a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, but where's the fun, you know? I, I, that's kind of where I was. So I was still in the transition mode. When I worked in the investment company, at the time it didn't make much sense, right? But I'm looking at now where I'm sitting here with you guys, and uh, especially you, Jason, and I, thought, how do I connect this dot? Why did I have that job? What, what, what did I learn from that? And so the, the takeaway from it was I learned teamwork. I learned to be along other team members and it was a diverse team member. We had men, women, and uh, you know, different walks of life. And I started very humble. I was a receptionist and mm -hmm. worked my way to a team lead where I was account managing for some of our investors. And that experience in there was, uh, was really eye-opener for me because it helped me get to training. It helped me interface people to how to build teams, how to communicate effectively as a team member and um, just some skills to, um, you know, personal development skills. They invested in their people to develop us. So that was like, wow. I was like, I need more of this kind of environment. I like it. So the journey took me to, um, you know, being a mom. And mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I met the father of my kid. And uh, the, it's, it's not a happy ending. Uh, we all have gone through our fair share of, you know, uh, but that was necessary. Now, sitting here today, it was a necessary part of my personal spiritual growth. And it took me to Canada, uh, not Canada, it took me to San Diego. 
<laughs> fast forward San mm-hmm. Diego. So I was never married to the father of my kid, but when I went to San Diego, I met another person there, and as fulfilled on the earlier story, at five years old, mm-hmm. I was going to marry an American guy, and I'm going to live in San Diego for eight years. That that really manifested itself. So. I'm confident in saying that because this will all make sense when I uh, elaborate a little further <laughs> down the line with you. But I, I basically lived in San Diego and I was, I wanted to start, I, I had this vision that I was going to be um, opening a boutique wholesale jewelry place by the beach. And so I did that. I went to Ocean Beach in mm-hmm. San Diego as a Canadian. I rushed into the thought of, this is so exciting. I, be, I get to be in the beach and didn't realize that the location and the demographic of Ocean Beach are not really people that really shop. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that kind of hit my pocket. I, I would consider that as an attempt to start and, and have my entrepreneurial uh, journey, but I epically failed. <laughs> well, and I think, uh, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have had a couple failures under their belts. So. Yeah, yes. It, but it was hard. It was hard because financially, you know, you're invested into it and mm-hmm. uh, you had your dreams crushed. Mm-hmm. And I s- said to myself, I am never touching another piece of wholesale jewelry ever again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, where do I go from here? So it, it puts things in perspective. Like when you attempt and you're you're really enthusiastic about a dream, you're like, where do I go from here? I was in my my, um, I was probably 27 at this point, very young. I said, hmm, I'm missing something. So I recognize that awareness that I am missing something in terms of business. And I said, okay, it's, it's marketing. But I sat there and as, as I was really contemplating and going, I, I guess I'm having a introspection. I said, uh, what, would it what would move this needle and I could go to school again and waste a couple more years of my life and I really mean that when I say that or I can find somebody that I admire that maybe I can work for and I can learn and I need to learn from a woman Mm -hmm. because I'm a woman I have a divine feminine in me my energy is feminine I, there's nothing wrong with learning from men, but that, at that time, that was the direction where my soul told me to go. I listened to it again. And so I found in San Diego, I worked for a lady who owned holistic um, practice and also going into business for herself to be a, a, a business coach. Mm-hmm. She has a, a book and she's actually um, top, I believe top 50 Forbes women in the world Mm -hmm. um, during the time I was under her uh, mentorship and guidance. So working for somebody like that, the the bar is raised. I learned the details that it took. I learned her her mind and how her soul that she put into her work and how the authenticity that came with being a leader, right? So that was a very humbling and learning experience for me. And then from then on forward, I just kind of pursued personal development. Really, people that go into coaching is because they want to help guide people to their highest level of potential, uh, be it in the business front or be it in, you know, if you're a life coach, you're, you're leading people to make really amazing decisions that's going to impact their lives and leave them to have a powerful legacy for their family. So that was, I, my eyes were opened. I think I found my, my place where I fit. I wasn't convinced yet because I had my ups and downs through the journey, right? It wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't um, an easy walk in the park. Let's just say that. So you were telling us, despite all the changes you made, all the the feeling like you were on the right path, there were still some struggles along the way. Yes, absolutely. And um, I want to keep this as real as possible um, because it helps others out there that are praying to hear some very authentic experiences from from real life people. I was, I, you know, I had a husband, but I felt almost like a single mom. I never despite of struggles on a personal 
front uh, at home, I never once said, I don't want to work. I've always said, I'm going to help move this family. I'm going to carry my own weight. I, I, need, I need to communicate that to you because there are single mothers that are, you know, tuning into you and, and looking for ways to how did how could she make it? How did she make it? So I feel that this is for this is a this is for us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had several jobs after the lady that I worked for that was in the Forbes, and after that, I just I started to um, work in other fields. Like the next field that I worked for was, um, it's a very you're you're gonna like this one. I worked for a gentleman who had a technology he invented. Mm -hmm. And I have to I feel like I need to share the story. And it is actually um, a, I wouldn't say it's a toy, but it's a flashlight that is integrated by a bracket that you can put on a, a gun like the M14 mm -hmm. and AK-47. And this flashlight is uh, paired with a button that can be integrated in the hand grip of the gun. Mm -hmm. Without going too much details, I know you're a military background, so um, Air Force. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I was thinking, why, uh, why did I apply for this job? <laughs> this is so far off my radar of you know experience or knowledge. But again, just because we can't see the complete picture doesn't mean that we're being moved exactly where we need to be so that I can sit here and tell this story mm -hmm. today. So I, I remember being interviewed in a boardroom and there were 10 other men and I was like the only woman, actually, sorry, there was two of us, two women and the rest are men. And the opportunity is, uh, the opportunity was, uh, really amazing because it, it was only for a it was a contract for about two years to do this project I'm given a project and my project had a code name it mm -hmm. was Comac and that is really an AK-47 gun and outfitting it with this uh, this this button that turns on the flashlight and has strobe functionality and it, it's it's uh, adhered to the gun with mm -hmm. this bracket right and I was thinking, are you kidding, Jen? How on earth are you even going to? You don't have experience in military. So those were the limiting self-beliefs that we all have been programmed to, right? So to make a long story short, I worked for this gentleman. We did well. They, you know, the technology was, was sold. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, fast-forwarding it to this experience today. And I said, what on earth? Why was I doing that? But mm -hmm. that same boss found me about two years, I would now three years ago, because he was so impressed of how I was when I worked for him that he had another thing that he invented that he wants me to bring me back on board. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, a good, that's a good thing, you know, <laughs> when they still look for you after all these years. He has his family, he's got his two kids. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the, the most interesting <laughs> job I took on because I actually physically had to go to gun um, gun places like gun ranges mm -hmm. and try to say, hey, I got this cool toy. You want to look at it? Like, put it on your gun. And if you're a female and you're attractive, it's, it's you know, you get some help. And But then they'll invite you to drink a beer and shoot some something in the, mm -hmm. the gun range. So I knew that I wasn't going to stay in it for too long. But that was some of the most unique uh, experience I've had living in San Diego was I worked for this gentleman who I would consider a genius. He really never really spoke a lot to me. He just drew diagrams all day mm -hmm. and Excel spreadsheet and pivotal charts. And that opened my mind that, you know, communication can be done in several ways, you know, and the way he's teaching me is not, um, it's not the, the way that we would normally get taught, you know, he's just, but he worked. I understood. And it's, it's, it's opened my mind. And there was this uh, curiosity because I thirst for knowledge. And I always, I, I always say to, to anyone that knows me, really, I'm a perpetual learner for life, like a student of the universe. So I always felt that way. So I love it when people can challenge me and can give me something to uh, dig deep on. So 
that and uh, the last thing that I ever did in San Diego was I worked for this amazing couple who are Americans and but they had a family owned factory in Mexicali, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of their account director at that point. Um, they were they were a great husband and wife team. That's when I started to feel uh, different about um, setup on workspace because you know uh, the uh, one of the owners, the CEO, would go surf during lunch break because we're literally in the La Jolla side mm -hmm. of San Diego where it's footsteps away. He gets out of the door. He walks. There's the beach. He has his surfboard during lunchtime. And he says, Neto, you're going to be okay over here? I'm like, yes, you're good. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he comes in with his wetsuit change and goes back to his oh. office. That now I can tell the story now, but at the time I was just like, oh, he's so lucky. I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I can do that. Well, I don't know how to swim that well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like maybe not, that's not a good idea. Maybe but not that. Not that, but I, it was the freedom. It taught me, my gosh, this guy is brilliant. He's smart. He works hard, but he's balanced. He's having fun at the same time. Mm -hmm. I said, I can do that. I'm like, it really literally was like, I, I was still in my 20s when this was happening. So you got to understand, like, it opened my eyes. I said, I want that kind of freedom. He's creating his own schedule. He says it's a short day on Friday because he wants to go surfing. And he can absolutely do that because we landed all our accounts. So that was the taste of true depiction of lifestyle. Like, you got a business you got big, big clients. He's handling everything. It's not a walk in a park. There were struggles in the company, but he's out there in the water, mm -hmm. nourishing his soul, nourishing what he loves to do. So I was like, gosh, I want to be like, I, I, not in the sense that I'm going to go surfing, but I want this uh, available to me. You want that freedom. I want that freedom. You want that freedom while still, while still having the responsibility of Bringing something into the world. Bringing something to the world and making your impact, you know, contribution. Now, this, the narrative of my story gets clearer and clearer as I go through the journey because, again, it's, uh, I'm invested in two things. The the lessons, from that's the most painful part. We, we're going to have to go through all it because we, we get the best lessons through the pain. And then the, the, um, the outcome. So I'm invested in both. It's not just, I mean, I'm not just invested in the good outcome. I'm, I'm here for both mm -hmm. because I have an understanding that it all will come together to uh, connect the dots and paint the whole entire picture of why I went through what I went through. I made that decision. I worked for that person. That person hurt me. Mm -hmm. That person helped me and mentored me. It's a beautiful symphony of, you know, coming together. And, and that higher conscious level of realization that really – if, if I could, if I've been given a chance to redo my life, I wouldn't redo anything because it's made me to who I am today. And this woman here today, sitting here, I trust her through the pain, through the struggles, through loneliness, through brokenness. I came here and I am trusting Jen. I trust the woman who I've become. Well, it seems like you've been very conscious about the choices you've made. Yes, sir. And, <laughs> and you've, you've had some amazing experiences that have brought you here. What brought you to Vegas? And, and what, are, what are the things you're involved in now? This is a little bit of a heartbreaking story, but it's the truth. So, um, you know, uh, it's hard to leave the beach. It's hard to leave that uh, sunshine weather, mm -hmm. uh, San Diego lifestyle. Um, but I worked so much that I wasn't really enjoying the beach all that much. Um, what brought me to Vegas is actually my son. So um, even though I was married, um, it wasn't a very good marriage. Okay, We had struggles and, um, that, you know, I'm just going to come right out and say it. He was narcissistic and very verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I was in a household where I was walking on eggshells almost every day while balancing being a mother and protecting my son from all of it and uh, uh, paying the bills. It, it was a lot. But now that I look back at it, it's to toughen me up because I have a really big mission for, for God. That's kind of mm -hmm. how I look at it. And so... In a way, um, 
I, you might have to help me out a little bit on on your questions again because I kind of got off track there for a second. Um, no, this is. I, I mean, I, I I love hearing all about this. I think the yeah. audience really loves hearing okay. about this. Um, it was just what brought you to Vegas. Oh yes. So, my son went to what's considered at the time top three schools. It was La Jolla. It was a public school, but it was rated well. And my son was uh, slow in speech and reading. And I've, but my son's, it's, a, it's an old soul. He's quiet, but his brain is just very different. It's differently wired than me. I'm very, I read, I write, and I, I like to verbalize. He's more of, he looks at a number and he can solve the most complicated uh, equations without showing any answers and he'll give mm -hmm. me the number. So I already know that, but because he's going into a system where there's 30 kids in a classroom and they're all different, they put them on the um, process of this is the way we're going to teach all of you and you guys have to conform to the way we're teaching you because if you have any special kind of disability, uh, forget about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't got time for that or we're going to put you through a system. And that's what happened. I was pulled into a room. I felt it was an ambush. I thought I was just there to meet about my son's, you know, progress. But I had a psychologist in that room. I had clinical people. I had the principal. I had all sorts of expertise in that room. And I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I walked in that room and everyone was, of course, just like, hi, you know, casual conversation. We brought you here today because here are concerns about your son being slow at reading and, um, you know, all sorts of things. And I listened, but that fire inside of me that any mother or any parent that loved their kid would have. It's the protection that we have for our kids. It's also, if something doesn't sit right, we don't have to take it. So that fire was ignited as I was listening to them make their diagnosis on my son, mm -hmm. who I birthed, who I've known since child. And, you know, and some of these people that are giving their opinions, they have not never had kids themselves. So I looked at the, the psychologist at the time and I said, do you have a kid? And she says, no, I'm I said, in fact, I think you're fresh from fresh out of school, right? You're giving a diagnosis about my son and you're going to offer my son to take what exactly? So they, they mentioned the drugs that mm -hmm. my son needs to take. And I looked at her, I don't think so. Bloody hell no. You are not going to put my son into Ritalin. And I said, my son is a perfectly smart kid. He's probably bored because his mind works really fast. The communication level is not the same. You guys mm -hmm. are not talking to individual kids as if they need to be engaged individually. because They're all different. And so at that time, it was just my word against mm -hmm. 10 other people in the room. And I just got up and I said, no way you're going to make my son into a guinea pig in your experiment. And in fact, you guys get funding for this, right? You get funding for kids, for every kid you sent to this stuff that you guys are setting up for my son. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no way I'm signing to destroy my son's life. So I said, we're leaving the school. I don't care. I'm going to find a teacher. I'm going to find another school that's going to help my son. And I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to send you all his grades and how successful this kid's going to be. I walked out of that, never looked back, slammed the door. And uh, yeah, my son had a couple more weeks. And I just started making plans. And I uh, started applying for jobs in, in another state because to put a kid through a private education with additional, you know, supportive type of people, specialists, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really ridiculous price in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me to Vegas. Okay. It's a mother's love. I said, I am willing to sacrifice my career, my life, what I built here in San Diego, my connections, my friends, <coughs> because I know this is the right thing to do. I'm going to fight this battle with my kid because he can't fight it for himself right now. And I didn't know this is where unwavering faith comes in. I didn't know if it was going to be successful, my endeavor, but I just know that there is no way that I'm going to put my son through that. I'm, you know, that is why we as parents, that is our personal responsibility to our kids to protect them and make sure they get everything they need to have a fighting chance to make it, you know, out there. So that's the decision why I'm here. And... <clears throat> This was during the recession, like around the 2008 
uh, time where you know the market crashed and there wasn't a lot of jobs available. Uh, in fact, I think I applied for 100 plus jobs before I got anything. So the, the humbling process is now here. Wow, like I, I took a stand. I took mm -hmm. a big stand. I told those people off and I protected my son invisibly, spiritually. <clears throat> and now where do you go from here, Jen? You gave up a, a good paying career mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to what, start over? Yeah, started over again. Uh, total shock like mm -hmm. from that weather here I, I hated it at first I hated mm -hmm. Vegas I was like I, I can't I remember like it's so hot and oh my goodness why did I move here it's like barren you know it's different now mm -hmm. so I was like well let's give it a shot so I didn't have the most uh, amazing job when I first moved here in fact it was it's a very humbling experience that uh, for some odd reason, I got back into jewelry. <laughs> mm -hmm. But this time I was designing jewelry for Pottery Barn. Mm -hmm. And that was the downtown incentives there with um, Tony Shea mm -hmm. and, you know, the building of the downtown culture here in Vegas. So I was, Tony Shea would come in, uh, in our office in the studio and would bring his dog Blitzy. And uh, he's like, can you watch Blissey for a second? Well, I'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, stamping on real gold and making mm -hmm. sure that every little millimeter of difference is going to affect that whole thing. <laughs> and then you can't make costly mistakes like right. that. But so that, that was my very humbling job. It didn't pay mm -hmm. much, but I didn't care. I was like, I'm open. I'm open to the experiences of the struggle and the in-between I call that the in-between, right? The gaps. And I said, I, don't, I, I can't do this forever. It's hard mm -hmm. on your hands and everything. I mean, I paid the bill. I never, never stopped working. I never said, I'm going to stop working. So that, that was the case, you know? And uh, fast forward, the next job was a lot better. That was now through Action Coach. Mm -hmm. So it's a business coaching firm. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the things I want to ask you about is through all these experiences, but especially working for the woman who was a business coach and working for Action Coach, mm -hmm. what did you learn about, and also from your grandmother, yep. what did you learn about leadership and leading teams and bringing, bringing something into the world with a team around you? With my grandmother is uh, her, her heart, for, you know, for what she does, her convictions for, you know, for, for life, integrity. Mm -hmm. So I think those are intangible virtues, really, that I've learned from my grandmother as I see how she functions, because she was a tax collector in the Philippines, where she would literally go business to business and say, please pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. And in order for people to and it's, they're poor and they're trying to make a living for their family. And sometimes they can't pay the taxes. So what they would do is they would barter with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw this as a young kid. They're like, I'll give you two fish if you give me three more days to pay mm -hmm. you back. And I was like, you can do that, Grandma? I'm like, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh. And, and that's how we kind of ate. Like, that's how we kind of fed our family. Uh, you know, because we were poor, but my grandmother, my my grandmother worked for the government, so mm -hmm. it's not enough, and she's paying for right. a lot of people in the family. But that was amazing. Yeah. Like, this woman is, like, going through, and they know her name. They respect her. She was kind to people. She says, okay, I'm going to give you five more days. Mm -hmm. Come up with the money, or else we're going to figure something out. Mm -hmm. So compassion was there with her leadership, and she treated people with kindness. And um, the lady in San Diego, well, she's more of a shark, you know, and... Uh, uh, while she is very feminine, she has her very masculine side to her as well. The strategic, uh, I need to have a strategic plan. And she's always, she's always kind of mentioned to dream big and to not be afraid of how big your dreams are. And, uh, and uh, her, the, one of the stories that I recollect her saying is that her dad was, was an entrepreneur and at a young age her dad said something so insightful to her that says okay all you have to do is print a business card and start giving it giving to the people that's how you start mm -hmm. like so when I thought about this and she has a way of simplifying complex things when it comes to starting a business and leadership and it's inspiring and the way the brand messaging and the tone of her you know business 
was something I resonated because it was really kind of centered in authenticity and feminine. Mm -hmm. So that's what I learned from her, that women can be bosses, that women can also make it, and that women can be respected. Because That's great. Yeah. So then uh, business coaching world where it's, it's, it's corporate. Oh, this one's a tough one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one is really learning to navigate around difficult personalities, mm -hmm. type A personalities, and not, and, and really uh, one thing that they're great at is they, and I, and, and I think this is really actually a method that they do, is they throw people at work immediately and see mm -hmm. if you can survive, if you can be independent and you can do your job uh, effectively with little to no instructions. They give you the best training eventually, but they want to see if you have the acumen to the business acumen to kind of yeah. go through the uh, ebb and flow of, you know, being in corporate setup, teamwork, multiple departments and 80 something at that time it, it was 70 something plus countries mm -hmm. of of you know dealing with that kind of a level of magnitude yeah wow so you've yeah. certainly learned a lot along the way you've had a lot of ups and downs yes but you also have some cool things going on now yes i do so, <laughs> so what do you want to tell us about the things you're working on now um well i got a couple but this this one goes close to my heart uh january of this year I really, um, uh, I was I was digging deep. I said, uh, I need to do something that's impactful. That's I feel that it's going to help. Um, and I, I've always loved working with kids. You know, I I, I, I love kids. So I said, uh, I would like an opportunity. And I, I said it to God and in prayers, you know. I said, I, I want to do something where I help kids. And fast forward, I am now a board of director for Whalers Family Arts. They are a nonprofit mm -hmm. organization here in Las Vegas. Um, what we do is we focused on um, age foster kids that get rejected out of the system after they're 18. So we work with 14 to 24 year old um, youth and uh, we give them life skill training. We create the programs, we have culinary uh, arts, media, theater mm -hmm. arts, and me being on board, uh, my team and I are creating a um, digital marketing course for That's the great. kids to take. Yeah, because we we are heading to that and it's not going away anytime soon. So it's a good thing for, for the kids. And we offer it to the kids who are uh, aging out of the foster care system so that they have a real shot at, you know, at, at getting good jobs and, you know, being their bosses because I encourage entrepreneurship to children that, that we, uh, we look after. So that that's what I'm very proud of. That's what I'm currently working on. And so you are obviously not doing this all by yourself. You no. have a team around you. Yes. So tell me about your team. Where did you find them? How are you growing your team to be yeah. future leaders? Tell me, tell me about everything about your team. Well, I started um, my my experience with uh, well, my inspiration behind building an agency, and I'm going to give credit is Instinct Media. Um, there was Mike and Laura. And Laura was the one that really headhunted me. Um, I was still working at Action Coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she headhunted me, and um, Laura's a phenomenal woman. So I respect her because she built this from, she built a, a hell of an agency in Colorado. And uh, she says, Why don't you come on board and, you know, kind of work? And I really want you to be a creative director. So I learned a lot. They, in a span of a whole year, the, I was working with people that there was no toxicity, there was no mm -hmm. politics, there was just how do we help each other grow, what can we do to be better, and I was given the right environment. That's when I thrived the most. That's when I said, oh my goodness, I don't have to worry about so-and-so wiping me under the rug mm -hmm. anytime, or somebody taking credit for my work, I don't have to do any of that. So this was the lesson, was I was, I needed to experience that, that side of the spectrum of a dog eat dog world setup, mm -hmm. you know, highly competitive, uh, politics, all that red tape to, oh, I like the people I work with. I want to get up in the morning and let's get started. Let's, let's go. And they're supportive. They invested in like even having a coach talk to me and the team and everything. And the brilliance between that is 
the way they set up the process and the systems, it's so very different from a typical, just a marketing place that mm -hmm. it was top. I know that they were some of the best people, some of the smartest people I've ever met. And I absorbed it. Like I just, wow, I was like, this is so great. And my skills has always been in sales, in marketing, in communication, uh, and um, taking that culture index personality assessment. Mm -hmm. I'm an architect, so I'm a master builder. It's in the, the culture index. They've done millions of people. Uh, architects are, based on my results, it's in the 5% uh, of the world are architects. So they, can, they have their visionary and integrator side of their brain they can give you the big dreams, but they also know how to uh, operationally create and make it happen and execute. So it was so nice to see that because I've always thought I was just right-sided. Mm -hmm. But then this gentleman that, that processed me, this is in Florida, says, do you realize that you're not even using, uh, you're only using about 5% of your brains? I mean, no, sorry, 22%. And he says, you need to be tapped into the 80%. You're in the right position right now. Mm -hmm. If we're going to onboard you for, you know, to be, uh, you know, the chief marketing director for a company because you, you're going to be able to lead. And I said, wow, I'm like, I, I, wow, this is so great. Like, of course, it's just a piece of paper with data, but I'm, I'm, I love data. So <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, the logical part of my brain is says, good stuff. Now I understand who I am, mm -hmm. but I'm also very spiritual. So in com combination data with intuition is it's a powerful combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's fantastic. Doesn't it make all the difference when you are on a team where people support you, they believe in you they're, and they're looking out for your future? Yes. Yes. I always say to people, you can't have a business without people. Yeah. So we are in the business to build our people first before we build any kind of business. So they are a direct mirror of my leadership. I love that. It's an absolute direct mirror. So if my energy is off, my social media strategist that, that's going to call me in 10 minutes is mm -hmm. going to feel that. And she's going to feel off. So it's a big responsibility to be a leader. People have to take that in a way where, you know, you really got to put yourself in check almost every day. Did I act in integrity? Mm -hmm. And I say integrity, and we all have different def definitions, and I keep it simple. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Absolutely. That's exactly what I, I look at. I'm like, when I hire people, is that a person of integrity? Will that person do the right thing if I'm not around? Will he represent me the best way possible? Or she represent me the best way possible? And so it's truly important. That is the key to any kind of a team-driven environment to have leader like people that can own their their job they can step into leaders hungry so it's like hungry humble mm -hmm. and willing to learn i i don't look for somebody who's i am the best no mm -hmm. i i just need somebody who's hungry uh, you know uh willing to learn and just you know willing to be mentored through the process that's fantastic yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, when, when I was looking, when I was in the Air Force, we had some direct hiring authority for a squadron I worked for, actually two squadrons. And I was always looking for the people who wanted to be there. I was, it, it didn't matter if they were the most skilled that we interviewed or not, the ones who really wanted to be there, yeah. wanted to contribute and wanted to learn were the ones we always ended up hiring. That's so good. All right, so I want to play a game with you. Sure. <laughs> All right, this game is called Rapid Response. Oh, <laughs> oh so my goodness. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And I want you to just tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. Okay. All right, you ready? Uh, trying to be ready. All right. Born ready. Jennifer Barber, Rapid Response, your time starts now. Okay. Podcast recommendation. Uh, Simon Sinek. Okay. Best pizza you've ever had. Bronx pizza here in Vegas, the white pizza. Okay. Good to know. I have not tried that. It's delicious. Where is that located? Port Apache. Uh, okay, Port Apache. Right. Something we should all be paying attention to. Our spiritual evolution. Oh, okay. Good one. Uh, okay. You get a choice here. Sure. And they may be the same thing. Okay. What is either your Get Psyched Up song or your Walk On Music song? Get Psyched Up song is, um, uh, good gracious, <laughs> this was a struggle for me because I, I listen to so many music depending on my mood. 
Okay, so uh, Get Psyched song uh, is Disney. It's the Little Mermaid part okay. of your world. <laughs> okay. Because I sing it in the shower. <laughs> There's, there's a deeper meaning to it. It's not just a beautiful, magical mermaid thing. It's a, a girl fresh in the water with this mm-hmm. strict dad and wanting her freedom and, you know, taking the risk to go and venture to the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> a book everyone should read. The Alchemist okay. <laughs> by I Paulo think, Coelho. I think we agree on that. I think everyone <laughs> should read that. Yes. Best Halloween costume. Uh, best Halloween costume was... Oh, oh my goodness. Um, okay, so it would be during the time where my, my son dressed up as a um, uh, Luke Skywalker and I was dressed up as uh, Princess Leia, I think, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're a big Star Wars fan. <laughs> I see that. Yep. Next vacation. Uh, Puerto Rico. Okay. <laughs> An important trend to watch. Oh my gosh. Uh, um, oh, wow. You got me on this one. Uh, does it, in, in what sense? <laughs> what do you think is an important trend we should all be watching? Um, who, uh, okay. Um, AI. AI. In, Good integration one. of AI in business, <clears throat> in everything, in right? everything, yep. in business, and even in finances. Okay. This one should be easier. Yeah. Favorite sports team. Uh, Vegas Knights. Go Knights, go. <laughs> go Knights, go. Go Knights, go. <laughs> Your biggest influence in life? My grandmother. I thought that was going to be the yep, answer. my grandmother. So she sounds like an amazing woman. She is. She truly is. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for playing our game. Thank you. I always like to... Letting me play. <laughs> to, asking, uh, to asking some questions like this to get to know our guests a little better. Yeah. Last night I was looking through your Instagram. Sure. And... You've shown that to us today, how introspective, how self-aware you are. But even though you've got that for yourself, you know, every few months on your Instagram, you find where you've done a post where you're sharing some of these things you're going through yourself and Mm -hmm. how you feel about an offering advice to someone. And it sounded to me like it was, there was someone somewhere who's finding that today. It's exactly what they needed to hear. Right. Um, you've told us a lot about your story, but how did you become so tuned into yourself? Is there is there something we've missed in your story about how you became yeah, so introspective and I, self-aware? I left the immigration battle for five years of my life. This is when I knew God was real. I'm trying not to cry about this mm. because this was a very tough part of my life. Um, I was in San Diego, and uh, I was denied. I'm Canadian. I had all the proper documentations. Mm-hmm. I have an immigration lawyer. Shout out to Josh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, everything was properly done right. But during this time, this was when we had the, uh, the, the 9-11, mm-hmm. all these other things that are changing that I can't ignore, external forces. And it affected everybody to a even a micro level like myself. Even as I'm not, I'm not from a third world country. I'm not, from, I'm not mm-hmm. a refugee. I am a Canadian citizen. So in that regard, I felt like I was targeted and Mm -hmm. I was denied. And this was the fight for my life, aside from the financial burden of it and the back and forth. uh, I was denied twice. The second one, I'm going to retell this story. I was put in a room. My ex-husband was in another room. And Mm -hmm. as I was sitting in there and they played good cop, good cop, bad cop, and they brought in my own person that spoke my language to see if they can just befriend me and Mm -hmm. it was all strategy but if you are telling the truth the truth doesn't need you know justice it doesn't need to be defended on yeah you don't have to defend the truth so that's kind of what I gathered from that was it was the longest interrogation of my life I think I was in that room for eight hours And my lawyer was waiting the whole time, left. And then when I came out, I felt defeated, Mm -hmm. like absolutely exhausted, mentally, spiritually, emotionally exhausted. This is a really powerful story. This is when I really made peace that I know God was Mm -hmm. got my back. And I came out of there and and my ex-husband, I can see from the the video, was slamming the table. He was so Mm -hmm. like pissed, came out. It was just like silence and then the lawyer comes up to me and I was holding tears and he says listen 
it's not good, but it's not bad. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Give me the bad. And he says, it's not good, it's not bad. They can't make a decision today. They were supposed to make a decision that day. That was the second thing. And he says, if they deny you for this, we can go to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't have any more fight left in me to go all the way to the Supreme Court. I'm going to have to rethink. And that meant everything I built again is going to be gone. I'm going to restart somewhere else. That seems to be the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... But I, something in me told me, I'm like, okay, it's not a no, but it's not a yes. And I said, did they tell you, did they give you any kind of inclination when they're going to make this decision? They said they're going to deliver the letter personally to your home. And I was like, when? And he says, we can't know that. So I was just kind of like feeling really hopeless, mm -hmm. like really like ready to throw the towel. I was so exhausted. Financially, it was draining. So I, I you know, I went home and you know, dealing with, uh, you know, my ex-husband at the time, he didn't mm -hmm. handle it well. So he was just slamming doors and just not, it's like, like, like our life's on hold. He's right. It was on hold. Mm -hmm. But deep down, I was free, though, in my mind and my soul that I knew that, that this is just another step of the, the pain that I needed to overcome. But it was just, I, when I went home and I walked in my house, I felt like this looming dark clouds was on top of my house. Like, I just felt that dark, dark energy. And I looked at my son. He was young at the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's no way I'm going to stay and be miserable and continue to, you know, I, I, I just literally just left the house. And mm -hmm. my husband went into the room, slammed the door, and I just went in my car and I, I buckled my kid in the, the car, and then I finally saw the, the steering wheel in my car, and I sat there, and I stared at the steering wheel. And I don't know why, but at that moment, I said, Jesus, take the wheel. I just literally verbalized that, and I said, and I cried so hard. I put my head down on that steering wheel where I'm just, <sighs> like, it's that deep cry, you know, as in, like, I gave it the best fight I could. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not able to... to uh, do it anymore. I'm tired. And then I forgot my son was in the back of the car and he goes like this with, with a little tissue. Like, Mommy, mm. don't cry. Here you go. And I'm like, I cried some more because I'm just like, oh gosh, I'm falling apart. Right. And so, um, I also said at that moment, I said, fine, I accept my, I accept my destiny. I accept my faith. Like fate. If this is mm -hmm. it, this, if I have to go back to Canada, so be it. If I got to have to make a life again over there, I'll do it. If this means like separation from my marriage, because my now it, it's so complicated, right? Mm -hmm. I was just, everything was just like, oh my gosh, where do I go from here? I don't have the solution. And that was the moment where I said, I accept, I surrender. I literally said that I accept, I surrender what you have for me, God. Because I think that you have a, a plan for me, although I'm not really, I'm, I'm really in pain and I'm hurt about this, what's going on right now. Um, but just for today, I said, just for today, can you just make me feel loved? Can you just make me feel like I'm not alone? I am mm -hmm. broken. I literally said that. I'm so broken. I don't know how to go about this. I've fought this far too long, five and a half years. So I went to Rubio's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I ventured with my son because, you know, Rubio's, and this was in La Jolla, and I walked in there, and um, it was crowded, and then the only table I could find at the time was a four-seater table. Now I have a little baby, so I felt, not that I was trying to be selfish, but, you know, I kind of like the, the extra room. I don't have to be so close to people. And I sat down, and I remember, like, a group of kids, and, you know, there was some alcohol in there, and they said something really not nice and it says some people they're talking about me some people do not have consideration and they take a four-seater chair when there's only two of them and i was like in my ready battle mode i'm like wipe my tears i'm like excuse me <laughs> what's your problem you know what i mean like um and then they laughed at me and i was just like i was i felt this little and i sat down and i shrunk in that chair even more because i was going through a lot already and I looked at the corner of my eye, and there was this woman. She, she had like an aura about her. She had a glow. And she was uh, mulatta, so, mm -hmm. you know, um, curly hair, just gray. And 
just staring at me intently with the kindest eyes. Like it, it almost like bothered my soul because I'm like, why are you being, what, it's like undressing me, you know? And, and then she looked at me and she smiled. And, and then I was like, like, look away because please, I'm a hot mess. Do not look at me. And then I looked up and she was right here in my face. And I was like, like taken back. But there was something so different about her energy, about her demeanor, and the way she was looking at me as if no one else existed in that room, just me. And she says, are you having a bad day, dear? And I looked at her, I'm like, yeah, I am. Like, I'm falling apart, like basically. But I didn't want to tell her exactly the details of what I was going on. It's a public space. And then I just looked at her and, and then she grabbed my hand like this and she petted it like 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 a long like like my aunt you know or my grandmother mm-hmm. right and she petted it and then she and then i looked at her and said what would you do if you can no longer see the light at the end of your tunnel translation i'm i'm, I'm losing hope I, I can't go through this journey it's too dark for me i've been through it and then she gave me the kindest eyes and she kneeled down and this is the most unusual thing in a public space. And my son was just so calm. And, you know, and, and I kind of looked at my kid, making sure he's okay. She kneeled down and she gave me a kiss on my right cheek and mm-hmm. my left cheek. Then she whispered in my ear. And she said, stop looking for the light. You are the light. You need to trust that you are chosen to have the divine light to go through that tunnel. Everything's going to be okay. I was like the heaviness in my chest is like lifted. It was lifted. Like everything that I've ever felt, emotional pain, disappointment, abandonment issues, all that lifted. And I was like, like, like I could breathe. And I looked at her and I said, like, really? And I was like, he's like, yeah, everything's going to be okay. And so I'm like this wiping my tears. I looked up. I was like, this can't be fast. You can't exit this fast. I can't see it. And I said to my son, son, did you see? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped this part. Before I did that, I actually asked for her name. Mm -hmm. I said, what's your name? And she says, you can call me Solera. I would never forget that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't connect all my dots yet, but I looked at my kid because I was worried because I was like, so focused at this woman. And I felt like nothing else mattered. And I just like laser focus vision tunnel on this woman and it's just like it's like everything just stopped for a second to have this conversation with her to comfort me I look at my son I said son you okay he's like this like nodding his head you know and I was like where 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 did she go and but at that point in time I felt so light like no more pain and I was like huh I'm not scared anymore I don't have anxiety I'm not having a panic attack I'm not sad. I'm not feeling broken. I walked out of there like I'm a brand new person. And then that juxtaposition image earlier of my steering wheel mm-hmm. caught me because the light was shining on the steering wheel. And I looked at it so, like this. It was then it hit me. It's like I asked to be comforted. I asked for God to show up and to make sure I'm not alone in this journey. And why? It could be the worst decision. I could be deported. Um, I could lose my kid because, you know, all these other things that have been set up. Um, I got inside the car and I said, wow. I said, thank you, God. I, you're here. I'm ready. Whatever the, the decision is, I'm ready. <laughs> like, I mean, somebody's so enthusiastic in case you get deported, Jen, you know. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I can do this. I can do this, right? And I drove home. And that dark crowd almost felt like it's been lifted out of my house. And I think at this point, um, I was like, okay, you know, it's going to be fine. And then I, I was happily, and then the ex-husband came out of the, the room and says, why are you so cheerful? I said, I, I couldn't even share because it was such an intimate moment spiritually. And then I says, oh, by the way, uh, they came in today and dropped this letter. And I said, I knew that was the verdict, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, it, it, it seems like it was sealed. It looked like it was closed. So he, I'm thinking he probably opened it already, mm-hmm. but it was poker face. I could not read him. I grabbed it and I said, and I said, I, I need some alone time. I need, I need to look at this. And I turned my back and I went to the kitchen because I don't want 
them to see me cry if it's 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 it you know mm-hmm. uh, but i remember like this is uh this is when i knew that th- the god is real um I looked at that paper and it says, welcome to the United States of America. I'm Canadian and I still fought for that for five and a half years of my life. It was a hard battle. It is really a hard battle. It's back and forth. And um, at that point, I just, um, I, uh, I smiled and it was a happiness because I knew that I was already, uh, that however bad we have it, however it may look like hopeless or situations, whether that's on a personal front or business, that I knew that there's a higher power that makes the final decision for us. But our heart conditioning has to be in alignment to for that to come in our lives. We have to ask for help. We have to surrender when we need to. And that was when I really knew God showed up for me real, real hardcore. It doesn't matter how much opposition you have, this battle's been won. I was going to be victorious. That is what he gave me. And I, I, I literally like fell on my, because of the struggle, I literally fell on my knees and I said, I am going to serve you moving forward. Thank you for not abandoning me in my times of need. And I'm going to make moving forward from here on forward, everything I do has to be impactful to deliver the message that you're here. You're, you're here available to those who wants you in their life. You're waiting patiently for others. So I wanna be a restoring gift and a blessing, whether that's on a business, on a personal front in every level. And that's where I get my deep introspection from because it's such an intrinsic part of who I am. It's a, that moment, it's a indelible, it left an indelible imprint in my soul that I can't go back to my old way of functioning, of thinking that I have all the solution, that I can cure cancer, or you know that, that, that science is gonna cure cancer, or whatever else is, is happening, right? It's, it's just that logical part of my brain was switched to, hold on a minute, here's another side of your brain, or your heart space, and it, it has to be in alignment. Your heart needs to communicate to your brain now that you know the reality that there are there are higher power in the in the work to sovereignly protect you, guide you, and be here for you when you really need to. There was no way. My lawyer couldn't believe it. So he didn't even know the verdict. So I called him and I was mm-hmm. shaking on the phone and he says, Jennifer, if I'm honest, I've been an international lawyer. I know the laws in Canada and I know the laws in the US for immigration. I have never had a client that went through what you went through. This is the most craziest in my whole career of 30 years being an immigration lawyer. I've seen someone battle immigration Mm -hmm. and it's almost as if like, I don't know why you went through this, but I'm so glad that they, they approved it. And that's why I value my freedom. I, it, yes, I am free in a, you know, in my own mind, but the freedom that we have here in the U.S., I fought for that, and I'm Canadian, so <laughs> that's why I had to share that. I knew that I wasn't, I was uh, slightly omitting this because I know I was going to get emotional, but... That is, that is such a beautiful, powerful, amazing story. Thank you. Um, it, it answered all of my questions about advice you would give to <laughs> folks who are feeling disconnected, feeling hopeless. So, yeah. so wonderful. I don't have to ask you those questions anymore. Thank you. <laughs> you, you are such a such a powerful, such a successful uh, businesswoman and leader. Thank I'm, you. <laughs> I'm so interested in what are the tools you use, what are the methods you use with your team to to help them grow into the kind of leader you are. Yes, um, that's a good question. So the mechanics of the leadership aspect um, is I really like, and I'm sure you guys have heard of this, of EOS, which is the Entrepreneurs Organization. The book Traction goes with it Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the mechanics of the setup of the process and running a team. Coming from a business coaching, that is the best. And I would say it's the most effective way to really uh, build your team and to uh, 
get everybody in the right seat so that they can there's no more micromanaging. That's what it does is it eliminates it. We are now building leaders to step into their game and they are accountable for their success. And so th- this the shift in perspective of, you know, just an employee to you have a real stake at, at making a name for yourself in the company. Just this is your we're going to give you everything you need to be successful. Take it. And here are the support system, the process, the organization that needs to happen in order for you to be successful at your job. We're setting people up with the EOS system. We are setting people up for success. That's awesome. I love that. I love setting people up for success. And we believe in that so strongly here, both here on the podcast and in my company of we're not we're not creating employees. We're building leaders for the future. Yes, we are. Okay. That's, I have that's a couple it. more questions for you, but I like to take care of the, the business before we get to these last couple of questions. You got it. <laughs> so tell everyone where they can find Jennifer Barber and where they can find all of the amazing things that you're working on right now. Awesome. Um, I am quite uh, out there in the social media. So uh, you can follow us in Instagram, which is uh, Empirify Agency. I will give you all this uh, spelling of that. We'll uh, and I'm also, for my personal one, I'm, I'm open to always meeting new friends, new connections. I'm all about enriching lives of others. Uh, so Jen Barber LV on my Instagram as well. On my, um, I have Facebook, the same same name for all of those. And our website, which will launch, is going to be mid-October. It's www.empirefyagency.com. Awesome. And your Instagram is awesome. It's very, oh, very you. inspiring. <laughs> I can vouch for that personally. All right, last couple questions. Someone or something you're grateful for? Uh, my son. I, I would say I built around, I've, I've sacrificed my life, and that's not in a, in a bad way. I, I made the right choices because my son saved my life in so many ways. I could have gone a different side of the spectrum here, but my kid was, I looked at him and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be here for this kid to make sure I, I guide him all the way to success till he has his, he can be great, his greatness. So I've always believed that. So I say my son, I'm very grateful for him. He is, uh, I am a true single mother. I don't have support. So it's me and him. We, we mm-hmm. built a team. That's why he's my best friend. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. Last one. Sure. Advice that you would give to future leaders, especially young women leaders? Oh, well, uh, from my experience, it would be somewhere along the lines that um, there are respective roles that both male and and female are, are very good at. But one thing that a woman needs to know is she is capable of building her dreams and making them into reality and that no external forces or opinions of society um, males or anyone else out there really truly matters but hers and it requires evolution of self in many layers and that this is deep but it is um, peeling and, and piercing through the veils of the layers of programming that society has uh, I can easily make that statement and you can make your dreams into a reality as a young woman, but gender doesn't stop you from achieve achievements and you really, but there's, there's an element that you cannot neglect your spiritual self and in the process of becoming who you are meant to be. And that is making the, the, the impact that you need to make in the world. And you need to learn to trust yourself and listen to those inner voice and guidance because they're there for a reason. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end it. Jennifer Barber, thank you for being here with us today. (laughs) Thank you to Litigation Discovery Group for allowing us to use this space and have such wonderful guests and create some great podcasts. Thank all of you for watching The Leader's Mindset. We love having you. Whatever you're going to do today, make sure you have an impact.